Okay, so thank you for joining us. Um, our next hour or so together, we're going to take some time to discuss some information and answer some questions for some recent funding that has become available for uh, public schools in the in Maine, as well as education in the unorganized territory to support efforts around public pre-K expansion. Um, and like I said, if you have any questions, please utilize the chat or unmute and ask at any time. For those that I haven't had the uh, privilege to meet yet, my name is Nicole Medor. I, I work on the early learning team here at the Department of Education, and I am the early childhood specialist. And I'm working today with my colleague, Shelly. You want to introduce yourself, Shelly? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shelly Shassi Gendro. I am the director of the Office of Federal Emergency Relief Programs, also known as some of the COVID money. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so some quick objectives for our goals today in, in offering this informational meeting. Um, we do hope to, to provide you some information around some recent federal funding that has become available to support pre-K expansion in public schools. Um, we also want to provide any application access and the process to receive these funds, um, the application requirements to receive these funds, as well as answer any questions from those in attendance today. So to kick us off, I'm just going to pass it over to Shelly real quick, if she could just give a brief um, sort of lay of the land in terms of what are these funds, why do we have them, and how can they be spent uh, just sort of surface level, and then we'll dig a little deeper into um, what's allowable. So we have received three emergency relief packages, CARES, CARESA, and ARP. They're all funded through the U.S. Department of Ed. And the funds were really designed to prepare, prevent, and respond to COVID-19 in whatever manner deemed necessary by the state. So the funds that are make, being made available for this initiative here is part of our state reservation. We've really indicated the need to be able to bridge and to start um, closing the gap of our students and the knowledge of our students. And we feel that this expansion program allows us to be able to address the learning that was the learning loss that was created in the pandemic, but also create a foundation so that further disconnect or, or gap of learning can be reduced in the future as we continue to evolve and move forward from the pandemic. So essentially these funds are designed to support specific initiatives determined by the Maine Department of Education, this being one of them. And the way in which we're going to be able to provide these funds is through a willing and qualified in regards to as many individuals as possible, SAUs, EUT as possible. We're going to try to be able to engage in conversations and hopefully be able to support as many as possible with the funds that we've des designated for this program. Do you want me to take the second part, Nicole? Uh, nope, that was okay. I'm happy to do that, Shelly. Sorry, I couldn't unmute my mouse was sticking. Anyways, <laughs> um, so perfect. That's uh, Shelly explains that far better than I ever would have. Um, so for public schools and folks in the EUT that are looking to expand pre-K, you could utilize these funds to help support those one-time startup funds for your public pre-K expansion in the 24-25 school year. So looking ahead to next fall. Um, so really this could support programs that are brand new uh, in locations that have not yet operated a public pre-K program before. Or also it could support uh, programs that are expanding. Um, specifically expanding student enrollment. So whatever your, if you have pre-K already, whatever your enrollment is this year in the 23-24 school year, if your goal is to expand that and have more students eligible to attend your school, then these funds might uh, be something that you could really look into supporting those uh, one-time funds or one-time projects, which I'll explain in more detail on the next slide. Um, additionally, we did just want to emphasize that when we're talking about student enrollment, we're talking about age eligible four year olds. So students who are four on or before October 15th of the next school year in 2024, um, any and all of them, 
also you could use these funds to support three-year-olds who have an IEP. Um, so three-year-olds that do not have an IEP, unfortunately, these funds wouldn't be able to support their enrollment. That's not to say that you couldn't enroll them in your program necessarily. It just means that these funds can't be tagged to support those specific students. However, looking ahead at uh, Part B 619 services and really trying to be um, really strategic and purposeful with supporting communities in taking on um, FAPE responsibilities or just trying to get more of those three-year-olds with IEPs into inclusive settings, um, that this was one way that we felt could uh, work to support that in many of the areas of our state. So for three-year-olds, those students would need to have an IEP, but for four-year-olds, it's just an age eligibility as long as they're four by October 15th. So some of the allowable expenses, like we mentioned, um, all public school districts as well as EUT can apply, and every SAU or EUT can apply for up to $50,000 in funding. So that's the ceiling amount. Um, if you don't need that much, then certainly you don't have to apply for that much. But if you need more than that, um, then we wouldn't be able to support anything above and beyond $50,000 um, at this time. But that $50,000 can really go a long way in supporting expansion or new programs throughout Maine. So in the application itself, it really goes into great detail, but we did pull some out for the sake of today's conversation. So uh, folks might look to use this funding to support professional development for your educators, your staff, um, any administrators that might have oversight of the program. You might use it to beef up some efforts in engaging with families and community members. We have staff on our early learning team who are really experts in doing just that. Um, so please, if that's something that you feel like funding could support in your area, reach out and let us know, um, and we're happy to help support that for you. The funding could also be used to defray any excess cost of transportation. Um, if transportation is something that you haven't offered before and you're looking to add it in next year or considering it, um, but cost is a real barrier, then now's an opportunity that maybe we could um, look to increase either bus driver uh, professional development. We could look to stipend uh, an individual to ride the bus when pre-K students are present, if that's something your district decides they want to do, it's not required. Um, many districts use one-time funding like this to add safety features to school buses, like five-point harnesses, for example. Um, again, not required, highly encouraged, and certainly something that this money uh, could support. Um, investing in infrastructure, like your classroom and your playground, right? Retrofitting that space for um, the age and size of students that are going to be now utilizing those spaces. Um, looking to support equipment or instructional material purchases. So we're now we're talking tables, um, sensory tables, dramatic play centers, um, nice wooden unit blocks, right? All of those things that we can buy once um, and have for years and years to come. Uh, extended school year services during the summer coming up of 2024. We know that many students that are, are in pre-K now or might be in your community settings um, could really benefit from having some services throughout the summer. So if they're looking to come next school year and expand your enrollment in pre-K, then certainly we could look um, to support them throughout those months as well. Um, and that goes on to include just general summer programming during the summer, right? Not necessarily extended school year for students with special education needs. Uh, I mentioned transportation as well as any parent outreach and support, perhaps translation services if it's necessary, um, things like that. Again, in the application, uh, there are other details as well. So really sort of think outside the box, right? Really think about what are barriers that you're experiencing now that are holding you back from expansion um, and consider whether or not this funding could uh, support that. I'm gonna hand it back to Shelly because this is really her expertise here. So we work in a platform that's called GEMS, which is our grant electronic management system. And what GEMS allows us to do is be able to capture an electronic 
application for the pre-K expansion work. So what we're gonna talk through a little bit is those sections within the pre-K expansion application. I did provide the web link on the left-hand side. However, one thing that I want to alert everyone to is GEMS has one username and password for an individual, an applicant coordinator at the local level. So if you can reach out to your ARP, e, um, excuse me, ARP ESER applicant coordinator, that would be your point person in regards to filling in this information in GEMS. So again, we won't, we won't create all brand new users for this program, but if you can work in tandem with your ESER applicant coordinator, that would be greatly appreciated. They will have access to the application within the system. There's a few different sections within the GEMS application. On the left-hand side, you'll see all of the different sections of the application. There's four different parts. There's the purpose, the application setup, which is essentially contact information, as well as um, superintendent information. Again, this is a willing and qualified program, so it is an up to request when we get to the budget section, but thinking about making sure that you have these conversations in advance with your leadership to be sure that this is an initiative that they also want to engage in is going to be extremely critical because your superintendent will need to sign off on all of the documentation in GEMS. They will receive an individual email with a username and password once the application has been submitted, and they will need to certify a few different sections of this application, one of them being the application cover sheet, the second one being the terms and conditions, and the third one is this section that we have highlighted on the screen, which is the certification of data. So you'll see that there's a few different questions, but essentially we're trying to capture um, some 23, 24 counts to create a baseline of that expansion or that enhancement that you folks are indicating you need some additional funding for. The next section of the GEMS application has four different parts to it or pages. Um, they All four of the pages are on this one um, slide. So the first one is the justification of the project activities. So providing a narrative of what that plan is going to look like and how you're going to address unfinished learning. Again, that's the connection to the funding source. As I mentioned earlier, the ARP state reservation funds are to prepare, prevent, and respond to COVID-19. So thinking about how you're addressing the unfinished learning is going to be extremely important when you're justifying your project activities. And there should be a, a thread that you can pass through all of these sections within part four so that they make natural alignments and connections to each other. The sex, second section in part four is actually on the left-hand side of the slide. It's called the use of funds. And essentially our team has highlighted some of the allowable uses that are naturally connected to this source of funding and to the work that we know you folks are doing when you're expanding or enhancing pre-K programs. So we, we encourage you to check all that apply, but not necessarily check every single box, really thinking about how you're intentional with your funds and what you are planning to utilize these funds for is going to be extremely important because the boxes you check in the use of funds are going to directly transfer into your project activity budget, which is the snapshot sort of in the middle of the slide that we have here. So what's going to happen is you have your justification that's going to tie into the use of funds that will populate your project activity use of funds narrative in that project activity budget screen. The third section of part four in the application is the goals. And you'll see that there's a number of different opportunities to select an outcome that we designed based on our conversations with our experts in the field. But there's also a box to be able to provide additional narrative 
when it relates to that outcome. Again, seeing that thread between the justification, the use of funds, the goals, and the project budget is going to be really important. So you'll see in the project budget, which is the fourth section of part four, really thinks about how much funding is going to be utilized by object. And those objects, i.e. salaries and benefits, should again, have that common alignment between all of the other sections within part four. So if we see something in salaries and benefits and under the use of funds, no, no uh, staff was checked or no hiring or training, we're going to pose some questions because there's disconnect. And we wanna be sure that as much of this information is readily available in this section of the application because this really is the meat of the information that we need from you folks to be able to approve the use of funds in the manner in which you've identified. So we've sort of bombarded you with some really quick information. And as you can imagine, um, that leads to many questions or wonderings. I will say before we get too deep into these, that as far as I, I think two big questions are going to come to a head, um, one of them being deadline for submission of applications, <laughs> which is a great question. Um, at the moment, as of right now, we don't necessarily have a deadline for submission of applications. In the event that that changes, that I suspect, I suspect it will, um, we'll make sure to notify the field and give you ample time, meaning three, four weeks, um, to assure that you have time to send them in. Applications are open now, so if it is something that you're looking to get going on, by all means, feel free to start at your earliest convenience with the team that you need. Um, and we'll just sort of look at those and, and have them come in on a rolling basis as you submit them. Um, spending for this particular pre-K expansion project began April 1st. So we're already a week into it. Um, so I suspect that if you're thinking this could really help my district with X, Y, Z, then we'll want to get a move on it so that those purchases that you're expecting to use these funds for can be made and we can start to, uh, the invoicing process. Um, and expenses, Shelly, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe need to be complete by, is it September 30th? Yes. Um, so it's a very fast and furious <laughs> opportunity for funding. Um, on the early learning team, in our experience for public pre-K expansion, we have, are, you know, are utilizing other pots of money. Um, and so we are able to have longer deadlines and different application processes, different budget processes, many of which some of you might be familiar with. And so this looks a lot different and this is operating much differently. Um, but we're still really hopeful that folks will, will see the benefit of it and uh, and access it because we want want it in your hands, right? We want it to support the young students, not go back. Um, so with that, I'm going to pause and and let folks ponder that. I can go back to a slide if there was something you wanted to reread or have us go over again, um, and then answer any other questions or wonderings. And feel free to unmute or use the chat. I think I know another question, but I don't want to jump the gun. <laughs> I think another common one is going to be if we expand our programs now, how will that look in the EPS formula? Am I right? Anybody have that question? <laughs> Um, so if we already know that you're expanding next school year, if we already know that you've estimated an increase of students, then if we taking care of that last fall with our finance team, then those estimates are likely already in your ED 279, and that won't be affected. You're all, you're all set. You'll still get the funding for that, that, that expansion through your uh, EPS formula. If this is a new conversation and you haven't already provided expansion estimates, then I can't guarantee that you'll see that funding this year. Um, it may be on that one year delay because the, if those expanded students may not be um, spoken for until the October 1st count, which will then go into effect afterwards. I think I'm done. Yes. 
Go ahead, Mark. Um, just wondering, so because the spending has to be done by the end of September, when you talk about expanding transportation, then the funding really would be utilized just for the transportation in September. If you're looking to utilize it for like staff or contract purposes, then yes. But if you're looking to utilize it to install something on the bus, whether it's a camera or five be piece harness or something like that, then if that could be done and expended over the summer, then you'd be all set. Okay. Thank that, you. that wouldn't be an ongoing cost. It would be a one time. Yep. And so one question I have is around the so we're in an expansion grant right now, but the kids did not show up. Yep. We ordered them, but they just didn't show up. Right. So, um, so like one of the questions I have is where, where the spending time is already now, can this be used? We subcontract for services. Can this funding be used to pay for staffing that is happening now um, in our current pre-Ks? My thinking, I'm sort of looking to Shelly too. I think that the invoices or sort of receipts for spending would begin the day the application is approved. Is that true, Shelly? Yeah. Okay. And if we did, we'd have to somehow be explaining within the grant how that is something different or additional, correct? Yeah, and and show that it will be support some level of expansion in the following year. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Hey, Nicole, I'll I'll go next. Uh, Nicole, is there is there another um, funding uh, another funding source in the governor's uh, supplemental uh, budget to further expand pre K? Happening right now. Yeah. So the opportunities for expansion right now is this ARP funding. Um, we are currently part of a federal preschool development grant that is exporting expansion with a partner, a mm -hmm. licensed community partner. Um, so those applications are out through a request for applications through our procurement office currently. Um, and then just the EPS formula. So I'm not aware of any other buckets of money to support expansion other than these two. Okay. Uh, it, with the exception, sorry, I will say, um, of any districts that are looking to be early adopters of students yeah. uh, with IEPs, um, but it. that is specific to students in special ed, not gen ed. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to keep this up, but I am just going to switch the slide real quick because on the next one has my contact information as well as Shelly's. So I just wanted to be able to give folks that information in case something comes up after today. You know, we have a number of folks from our early learning team present too. Did you guys have any questions? Or are you hearing anything from the field that might be beneficial to chat about? Maybe not. I was just, while I see your faces. Hey, Shelly, I, Nicole, I'll ask another question. Uh, a couple of questions related though, uh, to transportation. Mm -hmm. So we, we, uh, our transportation is contracted service through STA. Is what what are the rules around that with uh, four year olds? 
I heard you talk about it. I heard you talk about it, but um, it's not, it sounds to me like it might not be mandatory, which is a different yeah. story than I'm getting from our, from our, um, from our partners at STA. Sure. So I am just looking, hold on a second, Eric. Um, transporting four-year-olds for public pre-K programs is not required. It's optional. Uh, if a district chooses to provide transportation, then we do have um, standards in chapter 124 that outline it. And I'm just going to flip to it here so I can give you the exact section number because I know it's right here at the top somewhere. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so it's section 14. Uh, which falls on page 12 of chapter 124. And so basically it just outlines, I'll summarize that if a school determines they want to transport public preschool children, then it's recommended mm -hmm. that they follow um, the standards of care defined by the guideline for safety transportation of preschool age children. And then it goes into a couple sub um, categories, like for example, um, safety restraint systems, um, having an aid on board the bus to assist with loading and unloading yeah. um, and providing training and communication policy terms, et cetera. Um, the key word in that standard being recommended, yeah. not required. So we do have a number of public school districts that transport their four-year-olds successfully in a number of different ways. Um, I know in my home district here, we have six pre-K programs. They transport all of the students that need it um, with no additional anything on the bus. There's no aids, there's no safety harnesses, anything like that. Um, it, that's not to say that every ride is a great ride, right? I mean, certainly there are good days and bad days. Um, on the flip side of that, there are many districts that do put funding into buying a smaller bus or putting in safety harnesses or stipending somebody to be an aide on the bus. Um, so it's really what your community and what your school board and districts determine is the best way of transporting your students. Um, one strategy that we'll often recommend is that schools consider having an extra adult, if they're not going to do the five-point harness, then consider having an extra adult present, especially in the beginning of the school year, as students are navigating this big thing um, and learning the rules and ropes of being on a school bus and how to safely sit and, and navigate that space. Um, I, the transition could be quick for students or it could be a while longer. So, you know, you just don't know. Um, but certainly that's a great tactic to sort of put in place if you can. Good. All right. Thank, thank you, Nicole. Sure. Sometimes the children's backpacks are bigger than them. <laughs> so trying to get up those little stairs is a feat. <laughs> other question oh is there anything in the chat oh thank you marcy and sue for plugging those in there okay so it's only two o'clock i'm happy to stay on if other questions and, and things come up um this is not the only time or space to ask like i said shelly and i are more than happy to take questions um after this via email We'll send out the recording and so that folks will have this for team members that couldn't attend today as well. Um, but I certainly don't want to make people stay and stare at each other if you feel like there's other things you could be doing. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much, Nicole. That This was helpful to me. Okay, great. I'm glad. Thanks, Eric.